Welcome, everyone, to the technology track. So this is a lightning round. We have seven sessions, three minutes each, and we'll keep the time. The idea is to stimulate discussion around common themes, but get a lot of ideas in play, uh, hence the seven. But to have time for discussion, hence the three minutes per session, per talk. So we'll have the seven sessions. Then at the end of it, what I'll ask people to do is to think of questions that have come up for you, what common themes you saw, what questions came up, and discuss with one or two neighbors for two minutes to think through what questions you'd like to ask, and then I'll call for questions. So our first speaker. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Daniel Lee, and I would like today I would like to introduce our recent work, um, MOOCs in our group, uh, specifically linking MOOC content using human language technology. And by linking, I mean how to associate relevant topics, rev relevant piece of content from different places like different MOOCs or different forms of course materials. So, if a student they are interested like in in topic two, so. By accessing those linkings, they can find maybe relevant piece of content in videos or in discussion or in textbook, et cetera. And they can maybe also find re relevant like preliminary topics or advanced topics. So in this way, we would like to make student, enable students to create their own learning paths and we hope to make the one size fit all current uh, teaching technologies to more customized one. So today I would like to introduce several small topics, we, aspects we explored. So the first question we ask is, if we can really establish those kind of linking, does this really help in learning? So we conduct uh, one user studies on exploring two content delivery strategies. Uh, with the manual linking one, I mean, we establish linking with experts and to link course materials together. And with the unlinked interface, all those course materials are presented separately. And we test several learning applications, a search and a summary applications, and we evaluate and we found with our linking interfaces, students can search faster and they can summarize better, so linking seems help. However, to establish linking manually is not a scalable solution. So we also propose a crowdsourcing strategies to ask online workers to do those annotations for us, and we compare the result to the expert annotation data. And those annotation data can be used to establish the linking system, and can be used to train a linking system and evaluate linking system. And we found the quality of the linking based on the uh, online workers can achieve similar quality to experts. And the third one is we also propose a graphical model-based linking algorithms which can use uh, human language technology to predict linking automatically. And we also compare this algorithm to a more conventional information retrieval method, uh, cosine similarity, and we evaluate our results on the uh, crowdsourcing established annotation data, and we found our graphical model-based method can significantly improve the linking prediction accuracy. So the take-home message is the linking system seems help, at least in certain aspects of learning applications, and the HLT and crowdsourcing technology is promising for us to establish a, a automatic and sca scalable system. Yeah, thanks. Okay, our second speaker. And while he sets up, uh, I'm Chinmaya Kulkarni. I'm a graduate student at Stanford University. And so today what I'd like to talk to you about is how, if you look at face-to-face -face education, we all understand and realize that the best face-to-face -face education can be really valuable. It can help us both socially and well, as well as intellectually. And creating that kind of value online is something that we all really want to do. But when doing so, I think it's important that we try not simply to replicate what works in the offline world in the online context. I think what we should do instead is to look at online education as an opportunity to go beyond being there. So today, what I would like to talk to you about is how do we create educational experiences online that are simply unavailable elsewhere? 
Um, for instance, one of the great assets of the online world is the student diversity that we see in these classes. To leverage that diversity, we built this uh, online small group discussion tool called Talk About. And you can see a screenshot here. It's been used by around 3,500 students in 10 massive classes, uh, both on Open edX and Coursera. The way it works is that instructors create a discussion agenda that you can see on the left. And then when students log in into Talk About, Talk About automatically groups them into a small group discussion with classmates from around the world. And because you're grouping from classmates around the world, you can create a unique discussion experience that you don't see elsewhere. So this is a discussion from the social psychology class. And talk about grouped uh, this student from Texas with someone in Saudi Arabia. And as you can see from his quote, it gives him the space where he can talk about a topic with someone he would have never met otherwise. So this underscores something which I think is really important. When you have all the world to choose from, you can now algorithmically form groups, say based on you know, student performance, or if you want to have groups which are uh, balanced in gender, or have greater uh, geographic diversity. And we've seen that if how you choose these groups matters. So we ran a randomized controlled experiment in the social psychology class, and we assigned students to groups either from, uh, with participants from the same country, or to a discussion groups with participants from many countries. And we find that in the final, a week later, if you're assigned to a group with participants from many countries, you tend to do better. Uh, and this is significant both in this class as well as in replications in other classes. One reason for this is, of course, you become more of an active thinker if you see people who are different from you. So my dissertation research, again, is about creating these online experiences which are different and uh, unavailable elsewhere uh, talk about is one of the two systems in my dissertation. The other is uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, tool called Peer Studio for near real time feedback on uh, open ended work like essays. Uh, you can find out more about both these projects as well as papers, links to open source code, and resources at uh, this URL. And I'd love to talk with anyone who's interested in leveraging these opportunities. Thank you. Third speaker. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sanjit Seshya. I'm a professor at UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, at Berkeley, over the last year or so, uh, we've been working to enhance learning in lab-based MOOCs. By lab-based MOOCs, I mean these are MOOCs for on-campus courses that have a physical lab component. Um, an example of a course like this is Introduction to Embedded Systems, a course that I teach at Berkeley, uh, which has a lab in the first six weeks where the students learn to program uh, a mobile robot, uh, the iRobot Create in this case, uh, that's interfaced to a microcontroller board. And as you see, it has to avoid obstacles, climb this ramp, not fall off, and reach the flat portion, uh, the so-called hill. And here, the students get a really hands-on experience, but it's not just the hands-on experience here, it's also the access to TAs, the excellent TAs we have, like the one on the uh, Garvit, whose uh, who's picture is on the side. And it's really that combination of hands-on experience plus, plus feedback from TAs that makes this uh, a great learning experience for them. So our goal is, how do you uh, build an online virtual lab with a learning experience that's comparable to this one? So. Um, Simulation is the only solution that currently scales uh, to, the, to the MOOC setting. And so we built a, a custom uh, virtual lab environment called CyberSim, but importantly connected that to an automatic grading system called CPS Grader, uh, both designed uh, at Berkeley. And uh, as you see here in CPS Grader, uh, if the student uh, wants to debug their solution, they run a battery of tests and uh, they can run it in debug mode. And then when it runs um, right there, um, the, um, the, the, the tool not only tells the uh, student if their solution is right or wrong, but gives them personalized feedback about mistakes that they, they may have made, even though a particular test may have passed. Right? So that they, they can get the kind of feedback that an instructor or TA would give them in the lab. And this technology is based on uh, work in an area known as formal methods. Uh, we uh, specify the goals or the faults uh, in a notation called signal temporal logic, and we automatically synthesize these temporal logic testers as running in the back end. So uh, as I mentioned, we, uh, we ran this in a MOOC version of the class on edX a few months ago. 
And here are some key statistics. 86% uh, uh, of the students found the autograder feedback useful. We had an optional hardware track where some students purchased hardware, a very small fraction of students purchased hardware, and over 90% of them said that if the solution worked in the virtual lab and passed the autograder, it also worked for real. Um, and then uh, uh, students spend about five to 10 hours a week, and the peak enrollment, uh, the, the, the passing rate, excuse me, was 4% of the peak enrollment. I think uh, this area of lab-based MOOCs is a really exciting one, both from the research perspective and the teaching perspective. There's lots of future directions to really enable virtual labs in the range of science and engineering topics. And uh, I'm looking uh, forward to building collaboration so that if you have a course that you want to, a lab-based course you want to take online, and you uh, can build a simulator connected to CPS Grader, and we can build a, 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 a nice lab experience for your course. Um, and so there's many exciting areas to uh, combine formal methods with other topics, and uh, this tool will be open source later this year. Thank you. Our fourth speaker. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, I recently worked on a project. I'm Sabani from India, uh, currently an undergraduate final year student. Uh, we worked on a project on blended MOOCs, uh, which was an initiative by IIT Bombay. Uh, India has a large number of students interested in information and technology, and there are many institutions in India providing this education. There are around 5,000 colleges in India uh, but uh, the concern is the quality of education uh, we require. And IITs in India are the most prominent institutes. Uh, they provide a high quality education there. Uh, there are about 1.5 million students appearing for the entrance exams to these institutions every year. But the intake is around 10,000. So that is a problem. Uh, and hence, IIT Bombay has uh, created a solution uh, to provide a good quality education, uh, their own lectures uh, to all the institutions in India. Uh, why are they doing this? Uh, because uh, by providing lectures, uh, the time spent by the faculty with the students uh, will significantly increase. Uh, the time they rather spend lecturing, they'll spend on quality discussions. Uh, the practical sessions will be held under the supervision of the faculty in the local institutions. Uh, this will help the students learn better. And uh, the essay type answers or the ORA questions uh, like uh, we encounter in EDX uh, will be assessed by the faculty uh, rather than the AI grading. So we worked on two aspects. Uh, one was the open response assessments and uh, we worked on multi-stage large assignments. Uh, the open response assessments, uh, the self, uh, that was the same old self-grading, uh, then the peer. In case of assignments involving groups, we had two kinds of peer evaluations, intergroup and intragroup. So in intergroup, the groups would evaluate each other, and in intragroup, uh, the members of the group would evaluate each other. And there would be the staff grading, uh, since the uh, AI and the machine learning techniques are still under development for better accuracy. And uh, the multi-stage large assignments, uh, uh, we have a concept in India of submitting a final project, a mini project, at the end of a course. So uh, uh, there, there are generally three steps involved. Uh, one is the group formation. This will be done either by the teacher or by the student. Uh, then there is the assignment approval. Uh, the student submits his or her idea of the project, and it is approved or rejected with a reason. And the assessment will be carried out in the same ORA fashion, self, peer, or staff. Thank you. Our fifth speaker. Hi, I'm John Kotwicki from MathWorks. If you're not familiar with MathWorks, we're a company here in the Boston area that develops mathematical modeling simulation software. Our two core products are MATLAB and Simulink. 
and were used in a wide variety of applications from general programming, data analysis, visualization, modeling simulation, and general scientific computing. Starting around the end of 2012, we started to have a lot of professors approaching us uh, who had used our tools as part of their research and as part of their residential courses and wanted to carry these tools over to the MOOC. And what I'd like to share with you today are sort of the three ingredients to the success that we found in supporting uh, these efforts and these STEM-based courses that were using the tools. So the first is access. And this could be as simple as providing a download to students. However, uh, a much uh, richer experience is to integrate directly into the MOOC provider platform. And this opens up all sorts of new opportunities for instructors, including replacing hardware-based labs with software simulations, and using the MATLAB language to perform automatic assessment of student submissions. Now, in addition to providing access to the tools, there also needs to be content to help students learn how to use these tools and apply them to the concepts that are being discussed in the course. And so this is something where we've been active in providing content uh, for instructors as well. Our design philosophy here has been just in time, just enough. And so what we're doing is providing very targeted modules that can be inserted in with the assignments so that students are able to get exactly what they need at the time that they're doing the assignment. And uh, if you think about sort of the, um, the stress that a student encounters, they're already overwhelmed with having to learn uh, everything in the course, let alone a new software tool on top of that, uh, as well as the stress of instructors uh, who have to create all of this content. This is something that helps to save uh, a lot of time in that area. The final tier here is support. And so we don't just provide these materials and walk away. We actively monitor and respond to the discussion board uh, to help students. And this uh, has the interesting side effect is we get feedback as well as to how students use our tools to learn and uh, what we could do to, to improve. Um, so to summarize, the access, learning, and support, uh, the three tiers here, uh, for providing excellent tools for instructors to teach and for students to have a hands-on learning experience. Thank you. Our sixth speaker. Hi, uh, my name is Jay Kirsch Allen. Uh, I run a software development company in Toronto called Functional Imperative and a software boot camp in Vancouver called Lighthouse Labs. But I'm actually here in my capacity um, as a representative for the United Nations um, Special Envoy for Education, uh, currently Gordon Brown, former UK Prime Minister. Um, and he's got a proposal called the Global Education Platform, uh, which is an attempt to bring together a number of the more influential groups in online education uh, and using technology to, in essence, build a platform that will help those most in need, which is to say those with least access to those online tools. Um, the goals are pretty ambitious, and so in about three minutes, I'm just going to probably hit those goals, and uh, I'd be happy in the discussion period to get into some of the actual projects and platforms that we're looking at building. Um, but it's been about a year now that uh, we've been working on this. We've had a meeting in December uh, with a number of the, the key players involved. Uh, Brookings is running the Content and Accreditation Committee in conjunction with the OECD. Uh, I'm working with a number of software companies uh, from Mozilla to edX uh, to international organizations like the UN Global Compact to really bring together the key players. Uh, and the idea at the highest level is that the current global education system can't supply the quantity or quality of education uh, necessary to meet international demands. Um, and that's particularly true at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, and uh, technology sort of provides, in some ways, the means to do so. This was, in essence, the promise of MOOCs. Uh, unfortunately, as most of you probably know, MOOCs are, are barely uh, achieving that promise in the developed world, let alone the developing world. Uh, and so we're really looking at a, building a platform that'll uh, fix a number of the problems that exist with the current online education tools, or at least try to do so. Uh, so some of our goals include aggregating educational content from a diverse range of providers, um, establishing standards for quality of content, type of content, technology, um, 
We have to ensure that all of this content is localizable, obviously not easy, and most importantly that it's accessible. So it's going to probably have to come in, in some form that is uh, both including video and images, text, and even SMS. Um, we want to ensure that there's some sort of accreditation component. Uh, one of the key factors for most of these individuals is that once they achieve this education, they need to be able to then apply it uh, in a way that uh, can sort of get them a job. Um, I wanted to quickly touch on a couple of the partners uh, before I get to uh, the end of my time. So I'm going to jump through slides on MOOCs, which you all know much about, and uh, go through the list of uh, some of the people who are working with us, because you can see that uh, each of these organizations can play a role in ensuring that, for instance, the education we're working on focuses on primary education, that is to say K through 12, rather than the usual MOOC platforms, which obviously are these days mostly focused on post-secondary, um, free to end users. Um, that in some ways it's going to have to be a pick your own adventure type platform because the levels that people are going to be interacting with it are going to range dramatically. Um, it's hopefully going to include things like the best of some of the pedagogical learnings that have been discussed today and yesterday from flipped classrooms to hybrid classrooms. Um, and finally, it's going to be supported by governments, companies, and educators and employers around the world. Thanks. And our seventh speaker actually has two bodies and two heads. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff Helmer from the University of Texas at Austin. I teach music there. My collaborator is Andrew Smith Lewis. He's the founder and executive chairman of Cerego. Cerego is a memory management company that helps uh, students learn faster and remember longer in a variety of topics. And in January of, of 2014 on edX, we collaborated on a course uh, that was very successful in jazz appreciation. So what we've done is designed content uh, to try to bring together the massive numbers of people we're able to reach with MOOCs with the personalized learning experience that's involved in Cerego. So our, uh, we use this for most of our assessment uh, for this course, and we're using it in our continued UT Austin courses as well as a primary means of assessment. So what we're able to do is we've been able to create content that Andrew will soon be demonstrating here that uh, teaches many of the facts that are discussed in the jazz course and also helps uh, imbue musical concepts into the students and allows for uh, the collaboration to be individual and for the teaching to be individual in that way. So I'm going to turn it over to Andrew now to talk a little bit more about what's going on. Thank you, Jeff. So let's learn a little jazz this morning. Nothing like two minutes in a live demo. So I'm on the edX platform right now. I'm looking at two courses that have been integrated with the uh, our platform, uh, biology uh, here and also jazz. And I'm going to show you our jazz course. And in the jazz course here, we've got a practice your knowledge section built in uh, through LTI into the edX platform, and there are several modules here, how jazz works, jazz facts, deep listening. I'm gonna run our jazz facts too. And the idea here is that the application, what it does is take foundational knowledge and space it out over time so people can really master the basics. All the content was created by Jeff. So here we've got uh, my memory bank that shows my progress on content. I can see when I last studied the content or what my upcoming schedule of review is, all managed by the system. I'll show you what a little content looks like. When I run it, it comes up and it says, hey, do you remember which artist recorded a Love Supreme? Any takers? We are gonna go with Johnny Coltrane. So there's one item in the system. We've got some notes there that will give me some background about Coltrane. I can listen to a little bit of jazz. All contributed by jazz. Move on to the next item. Can I aim an error from the uh, artist from the fusion error? I will get this incorrect and I'll repeat that item. And in the background, what the system is doing is looking at not only when I'm given a question, do I get that question correct or incorrect, but how difficult was the task, and it uses all that information to figure out when I should see that content again in the future. If I jump back to the, I'll show you what goes on for the instructor as well on the analytics side. So here I'm looking at a course that Jeff is actually running live right now, and all of these little heads are individual students. So Jeff can zoom in and see how his students are doing. This is a live class at UT Austin. I can see when they last studied or what their upcoming schedule of review is. I can zoom in on an individual student and see what items they're struggling with, what content is easier, what content is difficult for them. So now I've run out of time. We have a lot more to show you, and we hope to get a chance to meet with you all in the future. Thank you. OK, thanks to all our speakers. So you should have some 
ideas for what themes came up for you? What do you wonder about? What questions you have? So spend now just one to two minutes actually with a neighbor or two discussing that. What questions would you like to ask the speakers? So this is one way to give the introverts also a chance to ask questions. So it's not just extrovert session only. Okay, so uh, I guess that's not a question for any of the speakers themselves, but it's a session here. Okay, what questions do you have for our panel? What sparked your interest, made you wonder? Yeah, go, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the microphone should be coming over. Hi, Cassandra Hori from Caltech. Several of you are integrating external or new elements into existing platforms, so I'd love to hear more about the process and the experience for students in kind of crossing domains with those apps or modules. Do you mean how was it, whether the students had trouble with it or were interested? Yeah, more about the student experience and whether it was seamless or whether they had ah, to jump. Okay. In. So um, given I have two projects, uh, both of which are external tools, I thought I would start. Um, actually, students have an easier time than you would imagine uh, because most of both the platforms that I've worked with, Open edX and Coursera, have single sign-on mechanisms, such as OpenID. And the, real, the only thing that students actually need to do is to click a button and say, log in, right? Uh, but the, the real challenge in using an external tool, or any tool for that matter in, with MOOCs, is making the value clear to students, right? Why should I be using TalkAbout, or why should I be using uh, my peer assessment tool? And we've noticed that just by making that value clearer, We've got from a point where 70% of students would come to our uh, external tools and do nothing to a point where we've got around, I think today it was 73% of students come in and decide to log into the system. So removing the friction is one part of it, but the bigger part is making the value clear to the students. Uh, just to answer that same question, uh, in our case, we had this virtual lab software, which um, it was of, uh, was of such that it couldn't be integrated into the browser into the the standard edX tools so we went for a local grading solution a local uh, solution where students would download the software run it locally on their uh, machines and all the grading would actually happen locally on the machines um, and then it would the results would be transmitted back to the edX server back to our server at Berkeley, cross-checked, and sent back to edX for the students to see. But all of this, you know, thanks to some great work by people at edX and people at Berkeley, uh, was seamless from the point of the student's view. Right? They were submitting their code, and then almost instantaneously, they would see the results on edX and the green check mark. Thanks. We were uh, very successful in integrating with LTI with edX. It was a pretty seamless process. There were no real problems. We were able to pass back data 
from our system to the gradebook um, so that students right there in the edX platform could get a view of how they're doing um, and the additional analytics that Jeff was able to use. And we were able even to integrate it in such a way that Jeff could determine grades for students based on their performance in the system. The only thing that we weren't very successful at our first run was probably mobile. So we have a mobile solution as well. And we only saw about 10% usage on mobile. So that's something definitely we'll be working on uh, the next round to improve. And uh, for MathWorks, it was actually an opportunity to enhance the student experience. Uh, for the past 30 years or so, we've been a, a desktop application. And if you've ever started up our applications, you know, they're complex engineering tools. There's a lot of features. Uh, students get overwhelmed seeing that for the first time. And so by integrating, we were able to pull out just the elements that were necessary for the lesson and take some of that away and make it a little bit easier for the students the first time around. Okay, thanks. Question. Um, so I have a question for uh, uh, Texas and Cerego. Uh, I, I'm sort of familiar with the system. It's a wonderful system. Um, the way I understood that you track the memory and things like memory decay for each learner in your MOOC. Uh, so here's my question. Were you able to identify uh, patterns uh, among learners who are dropping out as opposed to staying with the MOOC? As you know, attrition has, has been one of the big issues. I don't think we've had that much research on that particular topic, but what we noticed was we had a very good retention rate once people started. You know, once, we felt that Sarago was one of the ways uh, that was, we were able to keep people in the course, that it kept them engaged more than the traditional assessment. If I could comment a little bit on that. So what we saw at the end, for everyone who enrolled, we saw about a 12.4% completion rate based upon performance in the Cerego system. And 60% of those users scored on the honor roll, which was 90% above. And actually, a third of those users got a perfect score in the system. So we saw a good amount of engagement and retention. How that transfers to real world knowledge is a separate question. It, it would be interesting to see if you can identify, you know, along with that, uh, any any patterns uh, among learners who dropped out? This, this is what we're all trying to figure yep. out. Yep, I agree. Okay, question. Yeah. Hi, sorry, is this working? Um, the question is sorry. The question is for the initiative that's uh, led by the special envoy, the UN special envoy, and we have different questions uh, both targeted at the same uh, speaker. And I'll mine would one be... Question, please. One question, One question. There's so many in, yes. in the so, queue. OK, I just wanted to ask if it, all the platform was meant to do is bridge the employment gap, or are you thinking of a platform that will actually offer a wide range of MOOCs uh, to deliver to different objectives? That's a good question, uh, and it's a challenging question because a lot of the individuals in question need primary education, as I mentioned, rather than post-secondary education, and it's sort of hard to tie some very basic primary education to some of the, the skills that employers are looking for, uh, particularly the employers that, for instance, are going to be participating in the program. Um, I think in the end, inevitably, we're going to be uh, focusing first on education rather than on the employment possibilities um, because a baseline is going to be necessary. Uh, and, and that, again, comes with the primary education focus, a teacher training focus. Um, but that uh, because um, both the um, incentives, so financial and otherwise, um, and in some ways the drive for the entire project has come from companies participating in, for instance, the, Ugo, the UN Global Compact, uh, inevitably their interests will, I think, steer the direction of, of that education focus, that primary education focus. Hi, Patrice Prosco at Cornell University. And I wanted to follow up on the question of the tools that are outside of the platform. Um, you had said that students download um, onto their own computer. Did you have to provide tech support for students? Like, did they have issues? And um, were there any places in the world where students couldn't download the software? So did you provide like an alternative assignment for them? So uh, that's a great question. Uh, yes, we did have tech support. Uh, for this offering, we partnered with National Instruments. Uh, and uh, the simulator that you saw, the robotic simulator, is provided by NI. Uh, so NI, uh, as part of their participation, had their tech support team. And this is a global uh, tech support. So they had people in all the, the major regions 
um, I, I, 24 seven able to answer questions from students. So that was, that was a great plus for us. Um, of course, uh, the auto grader, the auto grading, grading system was completely developed at Berkeley and uh, students often, if they had issues that, that NI couldn't answer, they would post it on the forum and uh, as anybody who would do a MOOC would tell you, right, you need a team, you need a, <laughs> often a large and competent team. And I had a wonderful team of people, both on, from my research group as well as from NI and other people at Berkeley, who were looking at the forum. And you know, an, any time an issue came up, they were very great at responding to it. So I think that was a, that was a big plus. Now, in terms of the download issue, uh, yes, there, uh, there were complaints about the size of the download, but it was a one-time thing. And we alerted the students well enough in advance that I think everybody had everything set up just fine. And when the time came for the labs to begin, which was two weeks into the course, I think uh, it was pretty smooth sailing. Uh, so, Joy, can I add? Yeah, okay. yeah please go ahead. Uh, so, Talk About is based on Google Hangouts. And Google Hangouts, turns out, is blocked in countries like Iran, Belarus, a number of other places in the world. And so, yes, uh, there are students out there who we would really like to use uh, systems but can't right now. Uh, I think the solutions that we have done are, there, there isn't a single solution, but the ones that we've tried are a, providing ways uh, where they can have alternative means of participation. So you can do an in-person uh, discussion. You won't really get the benefits of a global community, but you have something. The other is uh, to make uh, the tools that we have self-service as possible. So if we detect that Google Hangouts is blocked in your country, then we show you the fact that it is blocked in your country and, or you can't load it because you don't have the plugin. And we try and help students uh, to go through that. And I think, though I'm a researcher, I, I think I spend a lot of time uh, on student support in some sense. And I think it's really important, especially when you're developing something new. Uh, so with Peer Studio, for instance, just yesterday we had like 20 different student in inquiries as to how they should use uh, the system. And we try and address all of them to start with and then try and convert them into self-service tutorials for students to use. I think that model has worked pretty well, you know, having this high touch to begin with and then making it self-service as we go. Thank, thank you for the insight. Uh, have you ever thought about uh, countries, for example, the country where, where I'm from, where gender mixing is prohibited anywhere, anytime? Um, so th in that way, learners will, will, will lose the opportunity to try the social um, activity or the uh, geographic diversified um, activities. What, what, what was prohibited? I'm sorry, I didn't hear Gender that. mixing. Oh, I see. So uh, Asma, you're from Saudi Arabia, correct? Right. So uh, the, the example that I showed was uh, a student from Saudi Arabia. And I think, actually, if you think about it, MOOCs are an opportunity uh, for students who are otherwise unable to participate in education to do so, right? So we've had lots of students, for instance, my advisor teaches a, a class on human-computer interaction. And one of the things that he told me was, you know, people who have mobility problems, right, can't go into the real world to do neat finding. Uh, you can't just say, go watch people in line, because it's hard to get to some, some place that's public and if you have a mobility problem. And what we can do with MOOCs is, make it a little bit easier for people who otherwise don't have that access to get access to such communication. So I, I don't really uh, know the social system in Saudi Arabia, but I know that a lot of students in Saudi Arabia, both men and women, are using TalkAbout. So, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think if in that case, I think an automatic system would, might also help like uh, automatic intelligent tutoring based on some machine learning or natural language understanding problem. And I think, uh, and yeah, there are several ways to solve that kind of problems for better learning. Like you can learn by discussion with your fellows. You can learn by an automatic tutoring system. And I think, yeah, so I, I think there is a ways can solve by uh, machine learning or more automatic way to do that. Well, I'd like to maybe add to your question. I'm not sure if it was answered. Is it that it's for, if for example, gender mixing is forbidden, 
Does that mean a MOOC course to be offered in Saudi Arabia must actually separate, say, sections or not allow different genders to discuss on the discussion yes, forum? This, this type of intervention would be needed. Like, you, you should select uh, the gender you, you will be, uh, or, I mean, honestly speaking, they should be controlled rather than an option. Um, so as an initi a, a new initiative with edX um, as a Saudi Arabia on a governmental level, we have this um, in, in, into consideration uh, done electronically or uh, technically to control the genders, so basically. Okay, thanks. So I have more of a comment than a question, but I run the biology courses from MIT on edX, so I can vouch for MathWorks and Serigo because we've worked with them closely. And I think the, some of the questions are about, oh, how was it for students or how was it for users? And as a course team, um, the thing that really worked well was the support that MathWorks and Serigo provided because instantly if we had a bug or if it didn't really work exactly how we want it, they immediately responded. And so if anyone's thinking about using them, they should definitely, you know, I can vouch for a positive experience on the course team side. And on the student side, there was a, a lot of positive comments about both. And I think for Sergo, we're using it more for, our course is more for problem solving, but it is flashcards and memory based, but the students still need to know basic facts and for biology and vocabulary. And I think that, you know, just adding that as supplement to the course helped a lot with the early on in the course and the material to help them just understand basic facts and help with that part, even though it didn't count for a grade for them, but they enjoyed it. There was a lot of positive comments on the forum for it. it yeah. yeah. I want to echo uh, what you said about the great support from Sarago. Uh, in our music course, we were able to not only cover some of those facts, but we were also able to teach uh, listening examples, which were really wonderful. So we had the students uh, learn how to recognize selections from a particular list and also learn from unknown selections, musical aspects such as form, rhythmic feel, a harmonic progression, those kinds of things. And so we've been able to try to find some other and uh, ways, some other topics to uh, involve with Sarago as well. And we found it seamless both in uh, edX and in Canvas, which is where we're using it now. And we're using it, again, as part of our assessment for the grades for the course. Do, do you think you could use it for, for example, uh, introductory calculus, say inter integration techniques, where you know there's seven or so tricks for doing integration, variable substitution, trig substitution, this and that substitution, uh, where it could just see if you get the right level of granularity. Uh, where the students need more practice and less practice, or how much involvement would the faculty have to have in doing the curriculum design to do that? I think math is a challenge for our system. It's not the best fit. I can tell you, though, anecdotally, we just finished a study in the K-12 space with 4,000 charter school students over a semester, and algebra was one of our best performing courses. Mm -hmm. You got a 13% bump on a final exam against a control group. Um, so. You know, they beat our expectation, and we certainly want to uh, inform the system to be better for math, but it is a tougher fit. Oh, okay, interesting, thanks. So it seems also one theme that I hear in many of the questions and answers is the scaling problem in just tech support. How do you, you know, if something goes wrong one out of 100 times and you have 100 students, well, that's okay, but when you have 100,000 students, you're up all night all the time answering questions on the forum, and how do you scale that? So one thing I think it would be good for everyone to think about is how can you push the knowledge back to the nodes of the network so that people can either can answer their own questions or find ways that it doesn't all come into the center. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, where's, oh, I have the mic now. There's the mic. So uh, I, I completely agree with what you're saying, but I would like to say that uh, often we think of tech support as a cost to deploying new technology, and I think actually it can be a great opportunity uh, of the 20 emails that I told you about yesterday, I think all of them are in some way me trying to do some neat finding to see what students really need, uh, to see how they're using the tool that, they use, uh, that we want them to use, and to see what is it that they're getting out of the tool, right? So uh, instead of simply looking at it as a, as a cost factor, I think it makes sense to also look at it as a way of looking at how, what students need instead of just asking them in surveys multiple times. Yeah, yeah. so it's anthropology and development yeah. at the same time. That's great. Yes. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. And I think to answer your question, how to scaling, I think there are several ways, like 
In our cases, we use a text information to do the inference automatically. And I think there are several research, like the Joe Hawkins and the Philip Gold, they analysis millions of click logs with the videos and to find the patterns, how to interact the videos and find which part is more confusing. Or uh, you can use uh, topic modeling to analyze the forums discussions to find is there any similar questions and you can answer those questions once and you can make your system more scalable. Yeah, also one, I think one, one also to add to that possibility is context-based annotations. So for example, the forums, people say, well, I had a problem on this problem or this issue didn't work for me, but you don't know, it takes you forever to figure out exactly where people were complaining about or had issues. And if there was some way of making comments right away, as was discussed say, yesterday in the annotation session, that would actually speed up the possibility of finding where the problem is and maybe actually for students to answer each other's uh, problems. Question, yeah. Um, this is more of a comment and I'm Sajel from UT Austin, part of Jeff's team as well and a pleasure to work with him. Um, just as a comment for tech support and supporting these integration tools and scaling them, one thing that I think Sarago and the team did really well is also come up with an introductory video for the students right before the course so they know what is the purpose of the tool, how it affects their learning, and how they're supposed to use the tool. Um, and we embedded that in various parts of the courses as well. So that really helped ground the students al also and just let them be aware of, here are the browsers that are supported, you know, this is how you're, you're supposed to use the tool, this is where you're supposed to use the tool and how it affects your grade and learning. So that, that really helped like establish a baseline for the external tool and also add in how they can get support for the tool. So that, that was a good model that I think worked for, for our course. And, and that's consistent with the comment, well, your comment before that it really helps. One of the most important things is to explain to students right. why are they using this other thing. You know, I think the have. communication is, is really key, just getting to that a couple of weeks out early into the course. We had an embedded systems course as well, and that had a software download and a kit to buy, but we allowed a couple of weeks of time for that to get that all flushed out. Thanks. Any comments? Questions? Yeah. This is just a microphone's coming. Follow up to the uh, embedded systems course. When you have kits involved in uh, lab kind of situations, where there might be virtual labs and kits, how do you scale that? That's a great question. Um, we had a lot of support from Texas Instruments who helped, helped the course and sponsored the course as well. So they helped with a lot of the web-based components, um, delivering and selling the kits yeah. globally and having distributors at different countries. So they were a big partner in that course. And just to add to that, in, for our course, as I mentioned in my presentation, we had an optional hardware track. The reason we made that optional is we wanted the course to be free, but those students who could afford something to pay for a kit had that option. Mm -hmm. And again, the partnership with the company providing the tools uh, was key. In this case, we, uh, we provided links to students to buy the robot from, I, from iRobot and to buy the, the microcontroller board from National Instruments. And, the stu and we gave them detailed instructions on how you put them together and make the robot. And there was a small number of students who were motivated enough to do that. Um, and, uh, and so I think, uh, you know, going forward, I, I, don't, I, I, was, I, I don't know if we'll make this uh, a, a, a mandatory option in the next iteration of the course. <laughs> mandatory uh, option. Because, you know, for, <laughs> for students to take, because it's, I think it's, Again, um, there's lots of places around the world where you can, you, it's very hard to get access to the hardware. Um, but we asked, we did a survey at the end and we asked students in the course, um, we gave them four options, like, you know, uh, for a future offering, would you be willing to, how much would you be willing to pay for hardware? Okay, and we asked them, you know, uh, either the first option was, I don't want to pay anything. Right? Second was, anything below $100 is fine. Third, 100 to 500, and fourth, I'm willing to go beyond 500, right? And what was surprising is a large majority, I think 
I, I don't remember the exact number, but maybe three-fourths or 80 percent, I think, said that they'd be willing to pay, right? Um, and uh, the large majority of that was anything below $100 is fine. So I think there's, you know, uh, these are all the students who, who were engaged in the last week of the course. So th uh, there is a population of students out there who are willing to pay uh, and you know, get the hardware and try things out for these sorts of lab-based courses, it, but it's an access question, with, you know, whether globally you have that access. Yeah, and to add to that, I mean, we had a whole shopping cart, and TI handled the whole distribu the distribution for it, and we had about 11,000 kits sold through that through di um, for different countries. So, I mean, there, there is a market there for students who are interested in really trying this out globally, so that was good to know. Okay, since we have no more questions, I'd also like to invite the panel to say any last thoughts that they have and messages that you want to tell everyone. So you can pass if you like, or you can say your last So two messages. I think lab-based MOOCs are a super opportunity, not just for teaching, but for research in science and engineering. And uh, uh, I think so that's something that I would uh, really encourage the research community to go out and, and think about education as a new application domain. The second message is the particular sub-area of computer science that I work in, formal methods, has a lot to offer to education at large, even beyond the specific lab-based MOOC uh, work that we've done. Um, I guess it's not so much a message as an invitation, right? So I think we've, we've all taught uh, people in some capacity or another and I think I'd like to invite you to see what if you could have this diversity that you see in the online world, or what if you had the scale in the online world, how could it improve what you teach students? And instead of uh, trying to replicate what we've already learned, I think this is a great opportunity here. So if any of you are excited about this, uh, I'd love to talk with you. And I think I'll uh, just take an opportunity to uh, summarize something that I think is kind of the, the theme emerging from here, and that is when you incorporate technology, you know, it's not just providing that, uh, that access. It's really all the things that go along with it, you know, providing that learning content, providing that um, support. Um, these are things that, you know, aren't insurmountable uh, challenges, but they are things that need to be thought about. And, um, you know, there are a lot of good tools out there. Um, something I was going to add to the discussion is, uh, you know, from our experience, just sort of monitoring the discussion boards, uh, the community really does kick in here. And, and great things happen at that kind of scale where students help each other. Uh, we, we found that when we do tech support on, on the forums, um, we often only need to respond to maybe five or six uh, items a week uh, in a MOOC because students are helping each other. Um, so those are things to, to kind of uh, keep in mind uh, when, you're, when you're thinking about incorporating technology into your MOOC. So I think I just really briefly wanted to suggest that um, I see the, the global education platform, the GEP, as a, an opportunity at this point for others to participate in shaping um, how a lot of the advances that you all are involved in uh, specifically will affect those who sort of need it most and those who probably haven't been talked about through most of the sessions over the past couple of days. Um, and I think that the, the concrete ways we do that, as my uh, presentation suggested, remain quite open, whether it's accreditation or whether it's uh, an actual technological device or a, an online platform. Um, and I think that input from you all is key uh, in terms of making sort of some decisions as to how the, the many resources that hopefully will be leveraged towards this platform um, are directed, uh, and so I welcome that input, and, and we do as a platform. I'm very bullish on uh, on MOOCs, and I think that everybody in this audience probably is as well. Um, and I think we have to team up together and show the world the value that can be generated from these programs. I think that, as Sensei pointed out, engagement and retention are very key. Also, transference to real world results are very key, um, and we're really um, excited to donate our platform to you all and our team of instructional designers and learning scientists to work with you to create great showcases and to help educate people on these platforms. 
Yeah, as a faculty member, I just wanted to stress something I heard this morning, and that's the importance of having a team around the faculty member. Uh, and I'm very grateful for the team that I have, both from the Center for Teaching and Learning at UT Austin and from Sarago. And it's, uh, I really appreciate many of you who are serving on those teams who may not be in the faculty spotlight. I appreciate that very much. And the last thing I would say is just that we think of a MOOC as a large-scale, impersonal thing. That's what I thought about it as when I first entered the project it was going to and it does reach many people. But the personal relationships that I've been able to build with students in that MOOC from around the world have been one of the most rewarding aspects of my involvement in, in this kind of project. OK, well, <clears throat> hopefully you have some food for thought about MOOCs and about learning and how you may change your own MOOCs or participate in MOOCs differently or design them differently. Let's thank our speakers for stimulating those thoughts and discussion. And now, let no one stand in the way of lunch. <laughs>